Well, welcome to another in the series about the life of Joseph. We're up to part four, and it's our chapter 41 of Genesis. And the title is Living Your Destiny. Living Your Destiny. Now, this chapter really uh, it can be broken up into two portions where we see this uh, remarkable moment where God reaches out to Pharaoh, uh, gives him a dream. Obviously, God is interested in the, the people of Egypt as he is in all people. He communicates with Pharaoh, but we also see not only God witnessing to Pharaoh, but of course Joseph witnessing to, to God's reality, the creator God to Pharaoh also. First half of the chapter. The second half of the chapter, we see a lot of information about destiny and how Joseph realizes God's call on his life. Let me uh, summarize it like this. In the first half of chapter Genesis, uh, in the first half of chapter 41 of Genesis, we see Joseph being an effective witness to the reality of God to Pharaoh. In the second half of the chapter, we learn principles from Joseph concerning walking in God's destiny. One of the most significant reasons we are on this earth is to be an effective witness. If we do this to our utmost ability, often our full destiny is then realized affecting all areas of our lives. Now, just to give you a reminder of what's recently happened in Joseph's life. Uh, he was falsely accused, remember, uh, accused of rape and ended up in prison. And he's been in prison for some time. And then there seems to be this opportunity where he interprets, interprets the dream of a cupbearer who was the cupbearer to Pharaoh himself and it was a favorable interpretation three days later the cupbearer is set free reinstated in his position and I, he, he talked with Joseph and jo Joseph urged him to consider his case because he was he was falsely imprisoned well, unfortunately, the cupbearer completely forgets about Joseph and two years have passed. We'll pick it up there, 41 verse 1. When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. He was standing by the Nile. When out of the river there came seven cows, sleek and fat, and they grazed among the reeds. After them came seven other cows, ugly and gaunt. They came up out of the Nile and stood beside those on the riverbank. The cows that were ugly and gaunt ate up the seven sleek fat cows. Then Pharaoh woke up. He fell asleep again and had a second dream. Seven heads of grain, healthy and good, were growing on a single stalk. After them, seven other heads of grain sprouted, thin and scorched by the east wind. The thin heads of grain swallowed up the seven healthy, full heads. Then Pharaoh woke up. It had been a dream. Can I suggest a, a very graphic and striking dream? Now, Pharaoh seemed to be disturbed by the dreams. He wanted interpretation for them. It's an interesting moment here, isn't it, where God himself is clearly reaching out to Pharaoh, communicating with him. And we realize as part of God's purpose, it's also to bring Joseph to a place of influence over the whole nation. But let me suggest this. Number one, an effective witness knows God speaks to non-believers. An effective witness knows that God speaks to non-believers. You know, I hope all of us want to be more effective at being a witness to the reality of God, but having that confidence that God is already speaking to non-believers is important. And I've certainly seen evidence of that many, many times. Uh, I've, I've chatted with people from a Muslim background on several occasions where they have told me about a dream that they've had of Jesus revealing himself as the Son of God, the divine Son of God. And that dream has been pivotal in them coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God still communicates through dreams. God is always wanting to reach the lost, no matter what their nationality, no matter who they are. We see this in actually him reaching out to Pharaoh. You know, um, something I watched recently, the uh, documentary Finger of God. I rewatched that uh, documentary just um, a few nights ago. And it, one of the striking stories in that documentary is about a Buddhist monk. The Buddhist monk has died. Uh, he's passed away and um, preparations are being made for his cremation. It's usually a three-day process as part of their culture. Well, he's about to be cremated and suddenly this Buddhist monk comes back to life. And this is what he exclaims. It's all a lie. It's all a lie. It's all a lie. I saw our ancestors being burned in some great fire, being tormented. I saw Buddhist monks there. I saw Buddha there. And it, 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 the Christians have the truth. They have the answers. Well, you can imagine, it was all pretty dramatic. This guy comes back to life and that's what he says. 
And so this guy had had some after-death experience, came back to life, and he's spreading that, that story, that testimony all over Myanmar. And uh, many, many people are being affected by it. Obviously, there's a, a recorded version of it that's being distributed widely by CD. And uh, that is impacting people as well. But I do not exaggerate by saying that hundreds of Buddhist monks in Myanmar have come to faith in Christ because of this guy's testimony and his witness as a believer in Jesus Christ. Um, it, by the way, it is illegal to have a copy of that CD in Myanmar. Well, um, it's just a reminder that God reaches out to people. Here's an extreme case. This guy had already died and yet God gave him a second chance. When we are confident that God has already been speaking to non-believers, it gives us a greater motivation to talk with, talk with the gospel, to share the gospel. Look at uh, verse 8. In the morning his mind was troubled, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt Pharaoh told them his dreams, but no one could interpret them for him. Notice that. Then the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, oh, Today I am reminded of my shortcomings. The Pharaoh was once angry with his servants, and he imprisoned me and the chief baker in the house of the captain of the guard. Each of us had a dream on the same night, and, and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard, we told him our dreams and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. And the things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position and the other man was hanged. You know, it's interesting to me that Pharaoh had um, the money to hire the best magicians um, those who could interpret things such as the future or dreams and that sort of stuff and yet none of them could interpret this dream rather it had to be a believer in the one true God the one true creator God this young man Joseph can I suggest this number two an effective witness knows the world is looking for answers from believers an effective witness knows the world is looking for answers from believers Pharaoh could not find an answer from those who were not believers in the one true creator God, but he could, in, he could from Joseph. You know, I was just thinking this week uh, about an occasion uh, where uh, having that concept clear in my mind that I know I should be expecting that God is, is reaching out to non-believers all the time and that actually non-believers are looking for answers from those who are Christians. They actually are on the lookout. They are searching. Um, well, I remember we'd um, gone for a holiday and uh, there was this um, uh, holiday centre and um, I started playing table tennis with this guy, elderly, older chap. And um, anyway, had a few good games of table tennis. He's quite a good player. And uh, we, we played again on another occasion and each time we'd have a bit of a chat while we are playing. Well, then I woke up one morning and I felt God say to me, Go and witness to that man. Go and share the gospel with that man. And uh, fortunately, I was alert enough to, to sense what God was saying. And so I, I went to um, the table where they were having breakfast, just went to the cafeteria area where, where everyone staying at the centre would eat. And um, sure enough, there was just the two of them at the table and God had conveniently provided a third chair. And so I sat down with them, had a little chat for five minutes or so, and his wife had to go to an appointment. But we continued to talk. And almost immediately from that point, uh, the conversation turned around to spiritual things. Unfortunately, this chap uh, had a well, potentially terminal illness. Uh, he uh, had cancer and there wasn't much chance he was going to survive it. Um, well, as we, as we got talking, um, I discovered he was from a nominal Catholic background, didn't really go to church, but he had that heritage. And one of the things he said to me was, but aren't, don't all religions lead to God? Don't all religions lead to God? And I said to him at this point, well, you know, that's partially true. Uh, and I, I went on to say, well, I do believe God's word, the laws of God, are there within the scriptures of the major religions. You think of Islam, you know, Islam recognises, uh, you know, the, the patriarch, Abraham. It recognises Moses as the great prophet and lawgiver. And it looks at much of that moral code in the Ten Commandments, for instance, and, and they, the Muslim is expected to live by them. 
So there's something of God's moral code there within their religion. Uh, the same with the Buddhism, for instance. You know, the Buddhism teaches the four noble truths, which I, I agree with those four noble truths. It says the eightfold path is, you know, the way to nirvana. Um, now, I do agree with the moral teaching of the eight, Eightfold Path. It's high moral teaching. It's actually very good. I don't believe the Eightfold Path will lead you to Nirvana, but I do believe the moral teaching is, is great. Um, what I'm saying, went on to say to this guy, was that the, the, the moral code is often in the major religions, but the difference is these are all religions that are trying to work their way to paradise, to heaven, to Nirvana. They're all trying to earn their way there. Christianity is very different. It's actually God reaching down to the people of the earth and providing a way to know him. It's not something we're going to earn. Yes, there is moral teaching, but it's not, we don't earn our way to heaven by living out that moral teaching, no. Rather, it's through faith in Jesus. He achieved this extraordinary thing on the cross where he died for the sins of humanity. And in this supernatural moment, it made it possible for everyone to be completely forgiven. And by placing faith in God, he's reached down to us and we can reach back to him. It's a different concept. And, and while I'm sharing this with him, you can see the cogs were turning. It all, somehow God brought revelation to his heart and he was embracing it. Um, you see, the truth is, he was a man who was searching for answers from a believer in the one true God. He was willing to receive them. I believe having a, a, a concept of that in our minds can help us be a more effective witness. Joseph seemed to have this concept, and we're about to find out. Yeah, 41 and verse 14, it says, So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream. And no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Now notice Joseph's response. I cannot do it. I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh. But God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Passage goes on, verse 28. It is just as, Pharaoh, uh, it is just as I said to Pharaoh, God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the land of Egypt, but seven years of famine will follow them. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten, and the famine will ravage the land. The abundance in the land will not be remembered because the famine that follows it will be so severe. The reason the dream was given to Pharaoh in two forms is that the matter has been firmly decided by God and God will do it soon. Notice there within those two passages, four times, four times Joseph mentions his God. And uh, this is the pattern in Joseph's life. He wants attention to be drawn to his God. Um, can I suggest this? Um, number three, to be an effective witness... Help the non-believers focus on God, not you. To be an effective witness, help the non-believer focus on God, not you. Servant evangelism has become a, a popular term where uh, people consider doing kind acts, you know, uh, nice things for people, doing acts of service for people. And I, I thoroughly agree, it's a good thing to do. But the fact is, if you don't ever actually tell the person about your belief in the one true creator God, if you don't ever be a witness to his son, Jesus Christ, if you're never going to do that, the person won't come to believe. You can be as nice as pie to as many people as you want, but they won't come to believe without you introducing them to the reality of God. And here Joseph, sure, he could have been highly cooperative with the Pharaoh, but he wanted Pharaoh to know that he, he didn't just have the skill of interpreting dreams. He wasn't just a nice chap, but actually he wanted to draw attention to God himself. Looking at the next passage, uh, 33, it says, And now let Pharaoh look for a discerning and wise man and put him in charge of the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh appoint commissioners over the land and take a fifth of the harvest during the seven years of abundance. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming and store it up and, and the grain under the authority of Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. 
This food should be held in reserve for the country to be used during the seven years of famine that will come upon Egypt so that the country may not be ruined by the famine. I find it quite striking. Charles Swindoll, in his study booklet connected with the life of Joseph, he asks the question of this passage, how do you think Joseph felt standing in front of probably the most powerful man on the earth? And the reality is, listen to the confidence in the way Joseph spoke. I mean, he's basically instructing the Pharaoh, this is what will need to be done. And it's extraordinary, isn't it, the measure of his confidence. And, and so we, we don't see joseph cowering at the before the pharaoh in fact you see this young man standing confidently before him you know um i i find the the whole scene quite interesting but you see the reason he could do this is because he knew the creator god the creator god is so much more powerful than pharaoh And he had confidence in that reality. Can I suggest this? Number four, when being a witness, speak God's will with confidence. When being a witness, speak God's will with confidence. You remember the early church, one of the things they prayed for. They often prayed for boldness. And um, people like Peter were so confident in front of the well-educated religious leaders, the Pharisees and Sadducees, They had all the power, Peter didn't, and yet with extraordinary confidence, he would be a bold witness to them, even to the point of times of having to suffer the injustice of prison. But nevertheless, he spoke with confidence. Now, friends, I wonder at a time like this where um, many people, I think, um, are searching for answers. They feel a little bit uncertain about the future because of the COVID-19 virus and the influence it's having over the world are we heading for a season of um, great change on planet earth you know is is the economy of various countries going to be severely damaged you know are we going to face famines and so forth all these questions are there in in people's minds and as people feel a sense of anxiety about this i want to make the suggestion this is a great opportunity to be a witness a great opportunity even the mighty pharaoh He felt anxious after two troubling dreams and it opened up his mind to listen to a believer in the one true creator, God. Well, friends, four points here. I believe we can learn from the way God operates with the non-believers and the way Joseph operates. Number one, an effective witness knows God speaks to non-believers. Two, an effective witness knows the world is looking for answers from believers. Three, to be an effective witness, help the non-believer focus on God, not you. And four, when being a witness, speak God's will with confidence. Let me just move on now to the second half where we look at Joseph realizing his destiny. Look at uh, verse 37. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and all his officials. So Pharaoh asked them, can we find anyone like this man in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Well, it's been quite a journey for Joseph. You know, he, um, he was sold into slavery when he was 17. That's 13 years ago. We find out in the latter passage that Joseph is now 30 years old. So um, Joseph has had these struggles. You know, just when life was looking up and he was, you know, managing um, Potiphar's household, everything turned sour again, falsely accused and ended up in prison. It's been an up and down journey before Joseph now finally seems to be realizing his destiny. Uh, Can I suggest this? Number five, your destiny in God may take years to be realized. Your destiny in God may take years to be realized. God may have a powerful destiny for your life. It's always up to us to search and to try and tap into that. But you think of some of these great leaders in the Bible. You think about um, King David. He's anointed by Samuel. Samuel tells him that ultimately he's going to be king of the nation Israel. And, uh, and then, you know, it certainly looks like it's heading that way. He slays the giant Goliath. He wins battle after battle after battle till it gets to the point where the multitudes are singing praises that go like this. Saul, the king, has slayed his thousands. David has slayed tens of thousands. Well, the king is not too happy about that song. 
as it elevates David above him. The king keeps a jealous eye on David and ultimately uh, he wants him out of the way. He wants him dead. And so David becomes a fugitive and for years he's on the run from Saul. And so even though David's already been told by the prophet Samuel, you're going to be king, it took years before he finally got there. Um, but, you know, it seems to be one of the ways that God, if God's got a huge destiny on someone's life where they're going to be in a place of extraordinary influence, he seems to take them through seasons of difficulty and suffering. Um, I want you to um, notice uh, what it says in the book of Romans to clarify this. Romans 5.3, uh, Paul says this, and Paul certainly knew about suffering. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint us. Well, moving into verse 41, it says this, uh, So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. He made him ride in a chariot at his second in command and men shouted before him, Make way! Thus he put him in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your word no one will lift hand or foot in all of Egypt. Now, just think about this for a moment. Joseph, uh, that morning, he woke up in prison as normal in a space of a few hours and one significant conversation with the Pharaoh. He's gone from being in prison to being the second most powerful man in Egypt. And at this time, Egypt probably was the most powerful nation in the world. Extraordinary that it happened that quickly. Well, can I suggest this, friends? Number six, your destiny in God may start tomorrow. Your destiny in God may start tomorrow. In contrast to the first point, it can happen so quickly. I remember uh, Dr. Sandy Hart, she, she um, was the uh, Dean of Studies at um, one of the Bible colleges I attended. And one of her phrases, I heard her say this more than once, she said, uh, God is never in a hurry. But when he chooses, he may move extremely quickly. God is never in a hurry, but when he chooses, he may move extremely quickly. T.D. Jakes has a great message about this where he, his message is titled, God has a place for you. And in the message, he emphasizes God's desire to you, for you to realize his destiny and purpose for your life, that God has a place for you. Verse 50 says this, before the years of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So he's, he's married now. Joseph named his firstborn Manasseh and said, It is because God has made me forget all my trouble and all my father's household. The second son he named Ephraim and said, It is because God has made me fruitful in the land of my suffering. So um, uh, uh, by uh, what we have from tradition is Athanas, um, daughter of the priest, was a very beautiful woman. Joseph marries her. And Joseph now is a second in, in command in Egypt, lives in luxury. His life is um, finally turned around. Life is good. And it's interesting, uh, the names he gives to his sons. Um, Manasseh, it sounds like it's derived from the Hebrew for forget and may well have um, uh, echo that meaning. And so he's forgetting some of the pain, some of the suffering, which has been pretty extreme. Brothers hating him so much, they sold him, um, being falsely imprisoned. He's had some nasty stuff happen, but he's forgetting it now. Life's good, it's, it's, it's fading into the background. And Ephraim, the second son, it sounds like um, the Hebrew for twice fruitful. He's feeling the abundance of God's blessing and fruitfulness in his life. Number seven, can I suggest this? As you walk in your destiny, the pain of the past disappears and the abundance of the future begins. Number seven, as you walk in your destiny, the pain of the past disappears and the abundance of the future begins. You know, you might have a situation in your life where there's been some difficulty, some struggle, some pain, you know, some deep discouragement. But you know, as you start to walk in God's destiny for your life, that will fade. It'll dissipate. It'll be forgotten. 
Finally, the last passage, Genesis 41, 53. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end and the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt, there was food. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. Then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he tells you. When the famine had spread over the whole country, Joseph opened the storehouses and sold grain to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe throughout Egypt. And all the countries came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph, for the famine was severe in all the world. An interesting comment there, you know, it potentially could have been a worldwide famine. The entire planet was being affected by the famine, but those neighboring countries to Egypt they could access food um, because God had raised up a servant, Joseph, to see to it that that was the case. I mean, we're in a, a time with, with uh, COVID-19 where the whole world is being affected, you know, and um, I think it's, it's, it's interesting journeys where, you know, uh, probably no one in memory has found a time like this, looking back and think, when, when has anyone in living memory had an experience where the whole world is being affected by something like this? I don't think it's, it's happened, um, you know, in uh, the last few decades. So we're living in a very different season. But in different seasons, it's interesting what God is wanting to do. Having a look at this season here with Joseph, where the whole world is um, potentially under the throes of starvation, God raises up Joseph to make a difference. Can I suggest this? Number eight, as you walk in your destiny, many lives will be affected for good. As you walk in your destiny, many lives will be affected for good. Well, we see this in Joseph, where Joseph really becomes a physical savior of the world. The world is provided for, at least the neighboring countries around Egypt is provided for. Why? Because Joseph had that insight from God to store extraordinary amounts of food. You know, um, as you live the destiny God has planned for you in this world, this world will be a better place. But we need to tap in. We need to sense what is God wanting to say to us. And sometimes God shifts. You know, sometimes it can be something unexpected. Joseph's uh, suddenly out of nowhere, everything changed just in a matter of hours. You know, I remember um, when I was at Bible college, uh, it was about um, 100 or so students at Weck Missionary Training College where I was studying. And um, probably about half of us were young couples without kids. There's a few families, a few singles, and uh, about, f- about uh, 50% were those who are young couples without children. And um, I remember after Bible college, it wasn't too long, we ended up going, going moving to Sydney and uh, establishing a new church there. And one of my friends um, who was from college too used to come out and speak, ready, a chap called Chris. Well, one of the, the students from his intake, his intake was... Um, uh, six months before ours, it was two intakes a year. And um, a, cu- a young couple in his intake, we did know them too, but they had had a really quite a shift, quite a, a destiny change. Because most people who did WEC would um, end up either going cross cultural missions overseas or they might serve in a parachurch organization or, or in a pastoral ministry. Um, these guys. After Bible college, they, they actually took a completely different turn, a completely different step in what they believed was God's destiny for them. Uh, so this, this chap uh, undertook a business course, pretty expensive. I think it was over, over 10 grand or something cost him to do this short course. Uh, but this, this course ended up, then he ended up pursuing business in that direction. And my goodness, um, they were absolutely blessed. This uh, friend of ours, Chris, was telling us they became multi-millionaires Overnight, um, Chris had been out on on, a, on their yacht with them, uh, enjoying the sunshine and uh, around the, the ocean uh, along along Sydney. And um, he was telling us about the, how their business had prospered. And so th- their change of destiny had suddenly become instead of them going off to be missionaries. God bless them so much financially, they funded missions work. And so the tables just turned around a little bit. This sudden shift in destiny. But I want to ask you the question today: Could God? In this unusual season that we find ourselves in planet Earth, I wonder if God has a a fresh, a new destiny over your life at the moment. Are are you open to what God might be wanting to say to you at this time? Let me just recap on those points and then I'll pray for you. Five things we've learned in the, four things rather, we've learned in the second portion of this passage. Your destiny in God may take years to be realized, 
But on the other hand, number six, your destiny in God may start tomorrow. Seven, as you walk in your destiny, the pain of the past disappears and the abundance of the future begins. And number eight, as you walk in your destiny, many lives will be affected for good. We see these things in Joseph's life. They're lessons for us to take home and learn. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. Father, I want to pray for people that have tapped into this message today. God, would you speak to them about destiny? Do you have a plan for their life that they haven't yet tapped into? Father, give us open ears to discern what you are saying. In Joseph's life, his destiny became so obviously significant, it affected um, many, many people for good. Those who could have starved now have food. Father, I want to pray that each of us would realize the importance of hearing your voice, walking in your destiny, and making this world a better place because we have responded to the promptings of the living God. And so, Father, help us be all that you've called us to be. Help us to be willing to cooperate with your purposes, with the destiny you want us to live. In the name of Jesus, amen.